Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. We continue in chapter 10, looking at these verses today, verses 22 to 42. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for your blessings to us every day. Blessings to us that at times like these, where there are viruses and challenges in our culture, seem like they are far away and distant. So be with us all. Help us be encouraged by the words of Jesus, knowing that he truly is the one sent by the Father for the forgiveness and, and of our sins and for our eternal blessing of life. Be with us in his name. Amen. John chapter 10, the beginning at verse 22 says, Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him. They hear the feast of dedication. The feast of dedication, also known as Hanukkah, and we celebrate that as a rededication of the uh, temple being cleansed after all the atrocities put in by Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the Syrian king. This happened oh, about 150, 160 years uh, before the birth of Jesus. After he attacked Jerusalem, it's said that he instituted a reign of terror on the city, and especially on the Jews. We're told that he stole millions of, of gold and, and silver items from the temple treasury. He passed some edicts. Uh, some of the edicts said that possessing a copy of the law of Moses, or the law of God, was, was punishable by death. Uh, circumcising a child was punishable by death. And any mothers in particular who had their children circumcised were to be uh, 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 hung with their child around their neck who had been circumcised. Uh, under his rule, the temple was turned into a house of prostitution. There were pigs that were slaughtered all over the altar. Uh, there was the great altar of burnt offering that was turned into the altar of the god of Zeus, the Greek god of Zeus. Uh, and under him it said that nearly 80,000 Jews were killed and another number of about the same sold into slavery. And it was the rise of the, the Maccabees in our book of the, or the Apocrypha. There are a couple letters, first and second Maccabees. It was the rise of this group of the Maccabees who, who put down this, this reign of terror. And by all uh, normal measures, there was one cruise of oil left in the temple to light the, the menorah, the eight candles. And by normal measures, that was enough for a single day. But by some miracle, when they lit it with that cruise, it lasted for eight days until new oil was prepared according to all the proper biblical formulas and was consecrated for use to keep the menorah lit. And so this was the celebration, Hanukkah, the, the, the commemoration of all that time uh, of the Maccabees putting down all that rebellion. It says it was winter here. I'm not sure exactly what that means, what winter may have been. Uh, some say the translation should be stormy weather or bad weather. Uh, but Jesus is here walking in the temple area. And here's this other confrontation. In this area known, it says, as Solomon's colonnade, Solomon's porch. Uh, that was a name given to a portico on kind of the east side of, uh, of the outer court of Herod's temple. Uh, the book of Acts says it was a place where Peter uh, spoke to the people. Uh, it was another place where they were uh, curing of people from lameness, a place called the Beautiful Gate near there, uh, and where they regularly gathered here. And so Jesus is there. Appears to have been an old part of the structure uh, uh, that was connected, some feel again, with Solomon's uh, temple. Uh, Jesus is surrounded. The Jews gather around him. And we're told here, again, some of the, the leaders are part of the group that's here and, and, and responds uh, rather hostily toward Jesus. We're not told in this section that he's teaching. This is several months from the earlier parts of the chapter where it said he was teaching in the temple area. Remember, that was Feast of Tabernacles. And so this is several months later, uh, and the Jews surround him. Uh, just that he's walking there. We're not told he's teaching in particular, but they gather around him and it says, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So again, these Jewish folks gather around, um, once again, sort of refusing to listen or believe in Jesus, maybe hoping that Jesus would make some claim that would uh, verify all this unbelief. Uh, how long are you going to keep us in doubt? Almost like telling the traffic cop, if you put up a speed limit sign every 100 yards, then I could keep the speed limit. But they're too far in between. You're keeping me in doubt. Um, they wanted him to maybe declare himself uh, as king of the Jews or make some kind of statement like that here so they could have him arrested, they could have him uh, put away. 
If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Tell us plainly. It's almost as if he's been cryptic in all his statements before, and they weren't quite sure what he was talking about. But he says to them, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe. And so he tells them, I've been telling you very clearly, very plainly. Uh, and Jesus, not referring to himself here as the Messiah, but, but I, here's miracles that will be showing you who I am. That word Messiah to the Jews, at least, was a politically uh, active word. Um, even had military implications that perhaps with the Jews, Jesus did choose to avoid. He did call himself Messiah, talk about that with non-Jews, like the Samaritan woman at the well earlier in John's Gospel. Uh, when she said, oh, I know Messiah is coming. And he said, oh, the one who's talking to you is that one. Uh, but to the Jews, what has he told them? Well, if we look through the Gospel of John, we see several things. He says, I told you. Well, he said, I'm the one who came from heaven. To Nicodemus, when he's talking with him. Whoever believes in me has eternal life. Again, to Nicodemus, John chapter 3. I'm the unique son of God. In John 5 and John 6, where he's talking with the people feeding of the thousands. Uh, I will judge all humanity. I told you you should honor me just as you honor a God the Father. I told you that all the Hebrew scriptures speak of me. I told you that I perfectly reveal God the Father to you earlier in John's Gospel. I told you that I always please God. I don't sin in the things that I do in John 8. Uh, I'm uniquely sent from God. Before Abraham was, I am. Remember when they talked about being children of Abraham. He told you, I am the son of man, prophesied by Daniel to the blind man as he's talking with all that section. He told you, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I will raise myself from the dead. Earlier in the chapter, he talked about that. So he's told them many things. The problem necessarily wasn't that he was unclear about who he was and where he came from, because they kept asking. The problem was these religious leaders had, had hearts of unbelief that perhaps they wanted to blame on Jesus. Notice he says, you did not believe. He says, you do not believe. Kind of a present tense structure there, saying this continues in you, this unbelief. And so the works I do, the miracles I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. But you do not believe. So even all these works, these miracles that he had done, a uh, healing of a blind man and all the others before that, changing water into wine, the very beginning, the first of those miracles. All these works tell you what and who I am. They're done in my Father's name, he says. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So the religious leaders wanted him to speak plainly. Well, here maybe he speaks more plainly than they really wanted. Earlier in the chapter, we saw the thing about shepherds. I am the good shepherd, and, and you're not being good shepherds, he applied to them. Now he says, you're not even good sheep. You're not even worthy of being called sheep. Because the Messiah's sheep, the, the, the Son of Man's sheep, believe and hear his voice. So that must have been even harder words for them to hear. Not only are they classified as not good shepherds, but they're no longer worthy to be classed among sheep that pay attention to the voice of their good shepherd. Your unbelief evidence, Jesus might say, that you're not chosen by God. You're not who you think you are. And it's not saying that they could not believe because God has somehow made it impossible for them to believe. It's an unbelief because they did not hear and follow Christ. Oh, wow. And he goes on to describe the blessings those sheep receive. I give them eternal life. They'll never perish. A life that we know continues from here on earth when we follow our beliefs in God all the way into eternity with our God. We have part of that eternal life here and now given by Jesus, but it's certainly greater than just physical life. It doesn't end when that physical life ends. Physical life can be destroyed, but those who are united by God in faith in this Son of God have life forever and into eternity. 
Neither will anyone snatch them from my hand. It's to be expected the good shepherd will take care of his sheep. He tells us that. The sheep are safe and secure in the hand of the good shepherd. As one of our commercials says, you're in good hands. And here Jesus wants us to know that. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So we find safety both in the hand of the Good Shepherd and in the hand of the Father. Because my Father, he says, is greater than all. This Father, more powerful than all the united energies of people and demons and the powers that are against him. So we can be certainly happy and rejoicing. Because when we fear God, we need fear nothing else this side of eternity. We're in good hands. But God the Father is greater than all. He says, I and the Father are one. Another great statement of relationship, an important statement regarding the the deity of Jesus, the nature of who he is. I and the Father are one. Means that the Father and Son are not the same person. Because obviously there's two involved here. Refuting some of those teachings that want to Uh, Sabalianism and others that say everything's involved in just one person but no I and the Father are one may we have equal in nature in essence who we really are which kind of refutes also the teaching that Jesus wasn't really God he's in full measure with the Father who is God one in essence one in being one in power one in will and so because of the way in which it's structured in the Greek, the, the one is, is what we call neuter in gender. It's not masculine. The father and the son are one. In the masculine sense would mean uh, they are personally one. But here it means they are essentially one. One in essence. Uh, one in being. One in spirit. One in power. That's the nature. Um, opponents of that, opponents of Jesus being God, I want to say the oneness Jesus had with the Father was just a oneness in, in, in purpose and in mission. He really wasn't God, but he had the purpose and mission of God in mind with him. Like a husband or a wife or a father and a son may have some unity of purpose and mission, but yet they still are not the same person. But that seems to miss the whole point of what Jesus is trying to get at here. First, we never argue the Bible teaches that The Father and the Son are the same person. They are one God, but distinctive in persons. We talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as being very distinct persons and yet one God. If you miss the point, uh, that even the true unity of purpose and mission is involved in a certain unity. Even when a husband and wife are united in their purpose and mission, or a father and son are united in their purpose and mission, they still are each equally and totally human. They are separate but united. The Father and the Son have that unique unity because they are equally and totally God. That's the way they have that unique mission. Jesus wants us to be one as he and the Father are one. And that cannot exist without that faith, that equality of essence. And Paul tells us in his writings, and Jesus mentions here, that we all have that unity, that same essence. So many miracles I have shown you, he says. All these things are done at the Father's direction. They were good because they were acts of obedience to the Father, acts of blessings to his creation. But notice again the reaction. Again, it says, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And so Jesus asked, well, I've shown you all these miracles, all these things that come from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? Which one? Well, they can't answer that specifically in that way. And they say, no, it's not for any of those things you did, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, make yourself God. Claim God for yourself. So the Jews of Jesus' day, very interesting statement here. We don't stone you for any of these miracles you did, but because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Apparently these Jews understood something that many of our groups today, maybe groups like our Jehovah Witness friends or our Mormon friends don't seem to understand. Jesus clearly is claiming to be God. and They understood that. We need to stone you for that. It's very clear that you are claiming to be God. He's not making himself 
anything but in word and in work showing himself to be what he truly is the son sent by the father to bring life and light to our world it was blasphemy to claim to be god it's noteworthy that jesus here uh, never gets upset with this charge never gets upset with them because he knows it's the truth if he were a mere man he would seem to be very upset with that claim because it means he's going to be stoned and put to death he would not be excited about this claim that they're making and Jesus goes on Jesus answered them is it not written in your law I have said you are gods if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken what about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent him into the world Jesus answered them. These religious leaders were gathering these rocks to stone him, but he didn't panic. He didn't run. He stops them, in essence, with the power of the word. He answered them, perhaps, as we might say, an educated rabbi would speak to other rabbis and Jewish leaders, would perhaps seek to uh, rebuke the charge of, refute the charge of blasphemy by, by an argument from Scripture with something they're familiar with, something they would know and could understand. Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. And this is going back to the Psalms, a quote from Psalm 82. You were called gods because of the, their office. These judges we're talking about were called gods because in their office they determined the fate of other men. So God calls these earthly judges gods in that sense. And the word law here, isn't it written in your law? Seems to be the broader sense, the whole Old Testament. Um, not just a specific point or a specific place. So if he called them gods to whom the word came, if God gave these unjust judges the title gods, would you consider it blasphemy if I call myself the son of God and the testimony of all the works I've done and all the things that are there? If any would sense, yes, they could be called gods because they had to judge and do things, how much more this one who has done the miracles, who has been sent by the Father into the world to redeem the world, to show them the idea of man and God being one wasn't necessarily alien, even from their old Old Testament scriptures, even from the law. But it's set forth there in various types and various shadows of him, the real God-man, the one who had come as fulfillment of all those prophecies. And he says, and the scripture cannot be broken. It's a general rule for all scripture, Jesus applying it here to, to even this rather obscure passage, perhaps meaning the scripture can't be emptied of its force. And he says, if that's how we believe and understand that, that scripture cannot be annulled or made void, not in some declaration that can be regarded as a key declaration, but what some might call a rather run-of-the-mill passage, then how much greater him who the Father sanctified and sent into the world. Wonderful way, perhaps, for Jesus to speak of himself here. He's the one whom the Father sanctified, the one whom the Father sent into the world. And so here he's saying that you may know and believe all this. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent him into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said, I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do what the Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. So again, wanting to show that indication of, of connection. But yet it says, therefore again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. Once again, these enemies of God try to grab him and try to put him to death in some way. Maybe they're still hanging onto those stones and ready to, to throw them. But it says he escaped their grasp. And then it says Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said was about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. What an interesting close to this section. He didn't remain in Jerusalem, where he'd been well, at the feasts and the festivals that were there among these hostile religious leaders but knowing the time was short because very soon he's going to be arrested and crucified we're going to follow along in the next few chapters all that he goes to the other side of the Jordan 
area of Perea, Herod Antipas uh, is sort of in power over here. The rulers in Jerusalem don't have a lot of authority over here, so safe from harassment at least temporarily in the place where one might have thought he would be welcomed in the temple and teaching in there, these leaders seek to stone him. Now he goes a, across the, the Jordan to this area where we might think people would despise him, but it's as many believed in him. Wow. So here Jesus goes across. And notice it says where John had been preaching and teaching early on, perhaps even near the area where he was baptized when he began his public ministry. And notice the reaction of the people there. Very interesting and very significant that as remarkable as the ministry of John the baptizer was, as powerful as that ministry was drawing people from all the various towns and cities, he performed no miracles. They say even though John didn't perform any signs or any miraculous things, everything he said about this man were true. Everything he says about this man was true. They kept saying, they implied, John didn't do any signs. Apparently he had a high character. Apparently he did have special works to do. Apparently he had a deep and lasting influence. And even though he didn't do any miracles or any special signs in that way, he earned great praise from Jesus. Even Jesus said there was no greater prophet that's come than John. And yet it says, then many came to this Jesus and believed in him. He still faced a lot of opposition from the religious leaders in Jerusalem. But as we'll see in the next few weeks, their greatest act of opposition was about to begin. And as we go through these next weeks and work through the end chapters of John's Gospel, we'll see that God's work goes on in spite of the opposition of man. But it's a horrible time for Jesus. And yet he willingly faces all the challenges and all the opposition. And in that we can rejoice and we'll see that continue in the weeks that are to come. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, help us truly begin to understand the relationship we have with your Son, our Lord Jesus. The way in which he is our good shepherd, we are his sheep, that we listen to his voice as, as good sheep listen to the voice of their good shepherd, that he cares for us like that good shepherd. We are truly in good hands in all that we do, even in the midst of the challenges that are around us now. So help us walk closely with that good shepherd, listening to his voice in all things we do this day and always, for Jesus' sake. Amen.